small crowd tonight. Wonderful. If I bring the spread out a little more, it'd be great. Okay, let's start from the beginning. All right. So today we're going to talk about some really fun stuff. Uh, what I like to talk about more than anything else is our perspective of ourselves within the universe and how that changes or evolves through the use of science. A couple thousand years ago, Chinese, along with many other civilizations, believed that during an eclipse, a dragon, a celestial dragon, was devouring the sun. What they would do is at the first sign of it, that's usually predicted by one of the Chinese astronomers, they'd flood into the streets armed with pots and pans and bats and wooden sticks, anything they could use, and literally they would bang on these items, making as much noise as humanly possible to try to scare this dragon away and have him regurgitate the sun and spare them from the darkness. Luckily, it always worked. Until one time that the astronomer was lazy and failed to predict the eclipse. And it happened without any of them knowing. So at the last minute, they all flooded the streets again to try to stop the eclipse, but it passed without them really doing anything. And they began to wonder, is what we're doing actually making a difference? Well, it's funny. If you want to know when the next eclipse of the sun will be, you might try magicians or mystics, but you'll do much better by asking a scientist For human beings, exploration has been at the core of our experience since our first treks across the old world continents to mankind's first steps even on the moon. It's been, or we've been tenacious in our journey to find what lies beyond that next horizon. And in the process, we've discovered a lot of things that have changed the way we see ourselves. For in the beginning, we saw ourselves as completely unique, created specially, individually, the entire universe existed because we were here, specifically. It's a beautiful picture of the planet Earth, something our ancestors could have never imagined having. But now we can stare at it, changing our perspective, realizing this is a closed system. There's no outside help coming to save us. We are going to have to make these decisions to save our own selves. The planet Earth we're all familiar with formed roughly 4.6 billion years ago. It's the third planet from its host star. It's the only known planet in the system to support biological life, of which 90% of the species are completely undocumented, which means that 90% of the life that's been on Earth, even alive today, we haven't measured it, we haven't documented it, we haven't, you know, we haven't found any examples of it. So let's talk about our beginnings. Roughly 200,000 years ago, the first of our species, Homo sapien, appeared in Africa. We were hunters and gatherers living off the land, uh, literally roaming with the food as it changed. Now, Africa wasn't the most hospitable environment. There was uh, lots of danger that we had to encounter and try to protect our young ones from. This is from the Natural History Museum. It's a uh, wonderful diorama they have that shows our earliest ancestors hunting and gathering, um, a lot of times even scavenging food from the other predators. But we had to eat. And in the process of cooperation and learning to work together, we were able to accomplish tasks never thought of before. This is probably close to actual size. If I had a spear, could I kill that? take a bunch of humans working together, but we did. We, we were able to hunt these and eat them. Pretty incredible. Roughly 50,000 years ago, there was a mutation somewhere in one of the alleles of our DNA that began to produce individuals that were much more creative than before. We know this because it was the first time that we saw abstract art, carvings into pieces of stone or pieces of wood. It doesn't look like much to us now, but back then this was basic design patterns. We also started to create what we call representational art, or art that represents the real world around us. 10,000 years ago, roughly, uh, actually 
the story behind the Lascaux Caves, there were some kids, like Boy Scouts out in France, kind of doing what kids do best, trying to mess things up. And as they were going around throwing rocks and breaking things, they broke through a small rock layer on top and fell into this and discovered what would be one of the greatest Neolithic uh, art discoveries in the world. Um, the amazing thing, this is called the Hall of Bulls in the last cup case. The amazing thing is if you notice, there's all these, oops, let's go back. There's all these dots and all these images. Some of them have cycles, some of them are strange. But if you look specifically at some of them, you'll notice things. you notice that these dots represent things that we normally see in the sky, which is the constellation Taurus the Bull, which has the Pleiades just above it. Our first steps were bold ones. We developed agriculture probably just from noticing that stuff grows out of the ground. You accidentally drop something, something grows from it. We've discovered agriculture, which allowed us to settle areas. We domesticated animals. We didn't have to hunt them anymore. We could raise them in pens right there where they were. We had food available to us. We established our first cities. And even more important, we discovered our first philosophy, philosophy religion, ritual, and culture. And one of the most important things we did in this process was not only developing technology, but we also developed a way to share that information with each other. We developed language. Now, it's really hard to tell exactly when this would have happened. You can't exactly find, you know, fossilized evidence of language. You know, and because we hadn't developed writing yet, there's no way to write it down. So, this was a major breakthrough for our species. We also developed mathematics. First is just for counting physical properties of things. I have, you know, this and this item here, and this and this item here. Oh, I can call that two and represent it somehow, and then I'll be able to count, and I'll be able to keep track of things. We later used it for abstract qualities. But even more importantly, it is easy to understand why writing is considered one of the most powerful inventions in the history of man. Long dead authors, people who died thousands of years ago, you can still read their words, you can hear their thoughts within your own head. Now over the next few thousand years, there'd be the rise and falls of many empires, shifts in rituals, the organization of religion, and even more important is that we noticed that the movements of the heavens corresponded to something specific. We, we built these observation sites specifically to measure these movements in the heavens. Plato once said that astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another. You can actually notice the spot there where the sun will go just upon the solstice. We developed calendars to represent things we saw on the side, like the cycle of the moons, or the sun. We noticed that a few of these points of light wandered throughout the background of the other stars, and we called them the wanderers. The Greek name for, or the planet's Greek name for wanderers, basically. And there was only five of them at first. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. We ended up naming the days of the week after those names, many other things. But more importantly, we started to develop science. Now, from the Latin, science means knowledge. Uh, Webster's defines it as the state of knowing. Knowledge is distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. But I like Aristotle's definition a little better. He says it's the body of reliable knowledge itself, of the type that can be logically and rationally explained. That's Aristotle over there, or as I like to call him, old dead white guy. Now, just before Aristotle's time, there was this amazing guy named Ptolemy. Ptolemy created the geocentric model for us, basically. This is a map of the world as it existed at that time. Not very much of it. This is Ptolemy's geocentric model with the Earth, of course, at the center of the known universe at the time, uh, with all the crystalline spheres around it containing the planets and stars and everything else. Now, even cooler than that, this is a representation of what they believed the entire universe looked like at that time. This is all. Basically, parts of Europe, the attenuated northern part of Africa and parts of Asia, with this strange underworld down here, just below the Indian Ocean. Of course, the winds, too. I'm not sure if those are angels or, or what, but they're controlling the winds of the planet. 
Now, this geocentric model that the Earth is in the center of our solar system would persist or, I guess, be enforced, depending on how you look at it, for the next 1,000 to 1,500 years. And even though we were able to make predictions that proved it wasn't, that just Copernicus with his heliocentric theory, originally putting the sun at the center of our solar system, uh, e even though this was presented, it was not believed for a very long time. A very, very long time. If people like Giordano Bruno, this amazing 16th century Italian monk who read Copernicus and understood that the, the, it had to be the sun was at the center, like none of this other stuff made sense, like this had to be it. Well, they burned him at the stake about 10 years before this man, Galileo, discovered the phases of Venus and the moons orbiting Jupiter, which would have helped seal the deal on that. Of course, we know that the, the sun moves around, or the Earth moves around the sun because of stellar evolution and parallax. Uh, at the time, this was the best thing we could do. We couldn't measure any of that. We didn't have the instruments at the time. But one of the things that Galileo did, along with a lot of other scientists at the time, was he helped really solidify what we call the scientific method, which was based on observations and experiment. It allowed us for the first time to really test our hypothesis and through that make predictions that can be observed and measured. The most important thing is it had to be falsifiable. We had to be able to fake it in order to understand. So the Renaissance moves on, new, new era of thought, new era of thinking, new era of art, literature, everything, and a revolution in science as well. Well, something horrible happened. Most people should be familiar with the plague. I love these guys dancing on the grave, this guy. Uh, well, during the plague years, uh, a lot of places closed down, and they didn't let people go out in public as much. Well, one of those people was this guy named Isaac Newton. And while the plague was happening in his hometown, he decided to take some time off, or I guess he was forced to not come to school anymore. And during the time, he decided to uh, work on some of his studies. And in the process, basically invented modern or the mecha celestial mechanics, laws of physics as we know them, universal gravitation. He uh, started calculus, uh, designed the reflecting telescope. And one day, I'm sure he was slightly OCD and being really bored, saw a beam of sunlight uh, coming through the room and decided to do some experiments on that. And by putting it through a piece of glass, we discovered that sunlight is actually divided into spectrum. All the rainbow lights into our invisible light, along with many others, which we'll discover slightly later. The amazing thing about the spectrum is we can measure it from pretty much all sources, any star. And from the absorption and emission lines, we can detail the chemical footprints of that solar feature. It wasn't the only thing that was happening. We're also looking at the Earth and realizing new things about the Earth. See, up until this time, it was, you know, the, the common common belief was just simply that the Earth was created as it was in its current state. But James Hutton was explaining to us that in order for these rocks to erode and the sediment to form in the way that it does, that the Earth has to be much older than the biblical date of creation that people were saying. Not only that, but when we looked in the ground, when we started digging places, we found these things that we didn't know what they were. Now the amazing thing about early paleontology is that we were finding these fossilized remains of animals. Uh, they were using comparative anatomy, basically looking at the bones and saying, oh, what does this look like uh, that's similar to something modern that we can compare it to? Well, they look like giant lizards. Maybe they're monsters. It's possible. What most people don't know is at the time, the accepted belief was that these type of animals were just hiding in remote areas, such as King, you know, the King Kong story with Skull Island, with dinosaurs and all this stuff. They just thought, hey, you know what? They got scared of humans, so they fled to other places. Because we know how much dinosaurs like to run away from humans. George Cuvier, in 19, or 1796, uh, gave a lecture at the French Institute in which he gave the first convincing evidence for extinction of species. This blew everybody's mind at the time. Extinction of species? We can wipe out entire species of life on the planet? They had no idea just how bad it was. You see, life on Earth has been basically a series of extinction events, one after another. We're actually in the middle of the biggest one right now, caused by us. But throughout time, we've seen the eradication of lots of life on the planet Earth. 
Uh, the first one we would call the Great Oxygenation Event. Basically, early life on Earth, about 3.6, 3.5 billion years ago, is when the first life began to evolve on our planet. Uh, these first cyanobacteria and the early little organisms basically uh, began to create oxygen as a byproduct. And through that, oxygenated the environment, which oxygenated the rocks, and once that had taken up as much as it could, began to oxygenate the atmosphere. And uh, oxygen is poison to them, so they basically poisoned themselves off and killed all themselves off, wiping out most of the life on the planet. Uh, there were several others. Uh, one of the biggest ones we know is the last one that killed the dinosaurs off. But the Permian-Triassic boundary, 96% of the species on Earth were completely wiped out. It was a sobering lesson for us to learn, especially with the recent news of meteor impacts and asteroids and things that we really need to start worrying about. Now around this time, uh, the Industrial Revolution is going on, and for the first time people have what you'd like to call disposable income. They were called the idle rich. People had money that they didn't have to immediately spend on food so that they wouldn't die tomorrow. And during this this age of discovery, you know, these two guys, Edward Cope and Othiel Marsh, who started what we refer to as the Bone Wars. Now, the Bone Wars is one of my favorite little funny things in history, and it's also quite brilliant. This intense rivalry between these two guys basically started dinosaur science as we know it. Uh, without it, uh, we wouldn't have most of the species that we know today. Most of the information that we know about dinosaurs today comes specifically from these two men. Now, in the process of making these discoveries, like I said, intense rivalry. They would bribe public officials to not let the other person's people onto a piece of land. They would steal the other person's stuff, like literally go in and just steal it all. Or if they couldn't do that, why not just go in with sledgehammers? Let's smash all their bones and all their fossils up. That way they can't make the discoveries. This did hinder the advancement a little bit, uh, but it also provided some really amusing stuff, such as uh, Cope named a dinosaur that had a huge backside, something, uh, I forget the first word, but uh, the last one is Marsh's anus. And Marsh, in an equally uh, but more long-standing view, named fossilized dinosaur feces after Cope. <laughs> That's dino poop. Not sure from which one. So, still thinking with geology, you have Sir Charles Lyell, who said that slow geological processes have occurred throughout Earth's history and are still occurring today. This influence of thinking is somebody very influential. Charles Darwin, who was a naturalist hired to keep the captain company during the charity of a South American expedition on a ship called the Beagle. The former captain that had gone on the expedition beforehand killed himself. Yeah, so they needed somebody they said to keep him company, but it's basically a suicide watch. You know, you go out for months and months and months and months and months, sometimes years on a ship, you get lonely. Well, during his time, he collected not just specimens, but fossils, rocks, lots of things. He traveled basically from England almost completely around the world, uh, but stopping in South America, ending up at the Galapagos Islands where most of his major discoveries were made. One of the things he realized, and one of the things that he began to notice, is that it was true. There were these layers in the rocks. And between these layers in the rocks, there was layers of fossilized remains. We could find, and we could find the same things. We could match up the same things that were on the coast of South America with the same types of animals and fossils that were on the southern coast of, of Africa. We began to put a connection together that the whole thing was formed and then started to evolve. There was these changing processes. We were beginning to realize that our perspective of ourselves just being created especially for this planet wasn't exactly true. We were expanding our minds slightly. Dmitry Mendeleev was the first person to produce a periodic table of the elements, and in doing so, he predicted elements that we hadn't discovered yet. Short time later, Marie Curie, with her theory of radiation, became the first woman to win Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry. Uh, cool side fact, all of her belongings are still kept in lead lined vaults because they're so radioactive they'll give you cancer if you go near them. So, amazing discovery, two Nobel Prizes, died a horrible death. Shortly later, Harlow Shadden comes into the picture. Now, this man was measuring globular clusters and he was trying to use them to estimate the distance from our sun to the center of our galaxy because we were still pretty sure that we were at the center of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. We're that important. Well, 
wasn't exactly the case. We're not at the center of the galaxy. We're actually between 25 to 28,000 light years out from the center of the galaxy. But maybe we're still at the center of the universe, right? Because we're really important here. Really, really important. Albert Einstein comes along. It's one of my favorite quotes from him. He says, the most beautiful thing that we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. It, you know, one of the one of my former professors always said that the, uh, the greatest words to ever hear when you're working on any type of scientific experiment or project or something is, oh, that's funny. Because it means it's something you didn't expect, it's something mysterious, and that means that there's a whole new problem you might need to solve. Now, Einstein gave us special and general relativity, and in it, he explained to us that gravity, one of our fundamental forces, is really a geometric property of space and time, and that we can combine these things into this four-dimensional space-time thing. And that mass, or the stuff that's in things, will warp the fabric of space around it. Now I know what you're thinking, the same thing a lot of people thought at the same time. What? How is that possible? Well, it turns out that mass does warp the space around it, and that orbits are a property of just things traveling around curved space. Another property that would have been predicted by general relativity would have been that large, large objects with lots of mass would gravitationally bend the light from objects behind them. It wasn't until decades and decades later that we would see evidence of this gravitational lensing. It's almost like putting a wine glass in the center of this image where the galaxy in the front is warping the image and stretching it all around, almost as if you're looking through a lens. Now, in doing so, Einstein also realized that when he was balancing his equations, that he needed to add a cosmological constant, which would kind of balance out gravity's effect. Um, and over a large amount of area, that this small value of energy would eventually cause an expansion. But it wasn't known that the universe was static, that the universe had always been there. Right? Well, maybe not. Edwin Hubble. It's a former lawyer, an insurance salesman turned astronomer. He was working with a 100-inch Hooker telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory, and he was measuring second variable stars in the Andromeda Nebula, as it was called at the time. One of the things about these second variable stars that's pretty incredible is there's a direct, there's a direct correlation between their luminosity and their pulsation period, which makes them excellent standard candles for measuring distance. So if we have a, say, you know, standard candle, say we have a light and we're trying to measure the brightness of that light, we know how bright it is, then we can move a distance, measure it again, know how bright it is from there. Once we know that, we can determine the ultimate distance to it by brightness. It also helped us measure distances to the other galaxies. And when we did so, we realized that all the galaxies, every single one of them, was moving away from us. And the ones that were twice as far were moving twice as fast, and the ones that were three times as far were moving three times as fast. So we saw it, right? We're at the center of the universe. Everything's literally moving away from us, so we must be directly in the center. And that's really weird to think about, that all of the gravitationally unbound objects in the universe are literally just moving apart. And the speed is determined by the distance that they are from us. Well, if everything's moving apart, then what would this imply? A Belgian priest when thinking about Hubble's implications in his data, said that the evident expansion of the universe and projected back in time meant the further in the past we went, the smaller the universe would become, eventually closing down into a single point. This is an amazing representation of what the Big Bang details, starting with the singularity uh, basically being this entire intense area of radiation you get a decoupling of electrons, cosmic microwave background. We have a very long time where it's just clouds of hydrogen and helium in empty space, and there's nothing. There's no formations. There's nothing. We get the first stars, the first galaxies. Roughly 4.5 billion years ago, we get our solar system forming. The present day, with the beautiful Hubble Space Telescope, takes pictures of a lot of this. Now, singularity, which is at the point, is basically where things stop behaving the way we want them to. We, once we get to a singularity, we can't really define what happens in that point. 
Now, singularity is at the heart of what we call black holes, or a three-dimensional hole in space and time that you can fall into from any direction. Try to picture that, a hole that you can fall into from any dimension. Now, we're going to show an image of a black hole. This is actually brand new. It's the first image ever taken, and it's quite breathtaking. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so shortly afterwards, we, in our, uh, in our search for all things with reality, we did sort of the standard model of physics, or we developed, I guess, what we could call the standard model. You telling that there's four fundamental forces at work: the strong, the weak, the electromagnetic, and gra electromagnetic and gravity. Gravity being the weakest, but having an infinite range. Uh, electromagnetic is also infinite, but much stronger than gravity. And both the strong and the weak force dominate things on the subatomic level. Well, when you get down to the subatomic level, we also discovered some other things, that all matter around us is made of these elementary particles. Um, and they're basically in two groups called quarks and leptons. And the interaction of these things is what makes all of the matter around us, at least the baryonic matter that we're able to see. Now, at the time, this intense rivalry uh, during the Second World War with Germany and the the Axis powers, uh, brought us into the atomic age and basically a race to create an atomic bomb before the other person would. Uh, it advanced physics incredibly. Um, but in the process, we created some of the most horrific weapons our Earth has ever seen. Shortly after World War II, there was a, I guess I, the best way to describe it would be a grab and dash uh, with basically all of the world's superpowers grabbing to uh, get what Germany had. They built V2 rockets. They had amazing technology they'd been developing, and we wanted it. Um, the Russians got a large part of it, but we, we got a bunch too. And in doing so, the Russians were able to, or the Soviet Union at the time, was able to launch a man into space, launch objects into space, and before us. But in doing so, we created this wonderful place called NASA. This is the meatball logo, as they like to call it. And the space race began. And in the immortal words of John Kennedy, he said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and achieve our goals not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. We did. On February 20th, 1962, John Glenn became the first man to orbit the Earth. I was going to put the audio from the video in here. It's quite amazing. Uh, John Glenn's rocket ride up, he literally screams, Woo! The entire time on the radio. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> and here's a picture of a man in space himself. I believe he ate some M&Ms. Can't do much. Uh, you get really sick in space. Not good for the summer. Short time later, the Apollo missions actually carried out Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon and returning safely to Earth. It was the Apollo 11 mission that really succeeded in this. And through that mission, we were given our first outside perspective of our world. This was the first time we had seen our planet from a distance. It's quite sober. Just after the Apollo 11 landing in 1969, something else happened in physics that was quite amazing. Hans Beth came up with this theory of stellar nucleosynthesis. It's a big fancy word. But we know that in the early days of the universe, there was some hydrogen, a little tiny bit of helium, and maybe some trace elements of lithium, maybe a little bit of beryllium, but mostly just hydrogen and helium. But stars, are atom-crushing machines. And the process by which the chemical elements are assembled in the cores of stars is what we refer to as nucleosynthesis. It's the reason we have elements that are heavier than hydrogen. It's responsible for carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, etc. All the things that make us up, that make up planets, that make up all the stuff in the universe. It's these stars, as they burn out and exhaust their fuel, die in amazing ways. It's the sun, our sun, also a star. And when a sun like a star of this size of mass dies, what it does is it swells up into a red giant after it 
exhaust that field eventually they'll expel its outer layers to the planetary nebula, leaving a white dwarf the center. There's amazing clouds of gas seeding the interstellar medium with all of the heavier elements needed to form planets, other stars, and things. Sometimes if they're really big, they'll explode in giant supernova explosions. A supernova explosion usually comes from when a star reaches the end of its life cycle, starts producing iron. The iron piles up and basically like a two basketballs double bouncing, they bounce off of each other and explode in one of the most massive displays of energy known to man. And from this we find that all the things that we're made of truly come from stars. And this inspired somebody, a man named Carl Sagan, who tried to teach all of us that we were made of star stuff. In the Cosmos series, Sagan once said that in order to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. And what a true statement that was. Sagan was a planetary scientist uh, who dreamed of exploring the other worlds and tried to inspire our nation to further space exploration. During the Voyager missions, we uh, put these amazing golden records on them detailing our positions in space, its relation to pulsars. He was an amazing young Sagan with the uh, Voyager plate with our naked people, the image of the Voyager uh, spacecraft itself, our position within the solar system, and our position within the 16 closest pulsars to the Earth. The image of the Earth rise stirred something within it. And during the Voyager missions, they took this spacecraft, and right when it was around the orbit of Saturn, he, made the, he came up with the idea of maybe we should turn this around and take a picture of the Earth, but the chance of aiming it at the sun and ruining the camera forever was too great, plus they had some other stuff to do. So they waited. They waited for a couple of years. They waited for this ship to get basically outside the, the orbits of Neptune, close to Pluto. And they turned it around, and they took an image that really changed our perspective for ourselves, known as the pale blue dot. Here, you can see the Earth. Just as a small, tiny point of light suspended in a, a sunbeam, just a product of the optics of the camera. It makes us look almost as if we're special. We're caught in a sunbeam, holding a sun. It wouldn't be for another 10 years when Hubble finally had its mirrors fixed and opened its eye in the sky, that we would get another perspective changer that would make so many people feel as small as this did. Hubble's eye in the sky was quite amazing. Of course, most people know that when the Hubble Space Telescope first went up, there was a problem, and the first images that came back were blurry and funky and looked no better than any ground-based telescopes. But we sent up a repair mission replacing the, the broken equipment, and the images we got back were breathtaking and stunning. We realized that there was fields of stars beyond anything we could have imagined. There were... The edge of our own Milky Way galaxy was completely populated with dust and gas. We found other galaxies just as breathtaking and inspiring. And all of them in different forms of galactic evolution. Some type spirals, some barred spirals, some loose elliptical, some just irregular. Some at the end of their lives. But in doing so, we notice that there's not just stars out there, but there's galaxies. There's lots and lots and lots of galaxies. And these are filled up with stars and giant glass clouds of hydrogen and helium and other trace elements, which under the force of gravity will eventually collapse and form other stars. It's the pillars of creation, famous image a lot of us are familiar with, comes literally just from the tip of this giant hydrogen cloud. And within these dark areas, stellar nurseries where stars are born and formed. Sometimes we find that the stars are long gone and only their remnants of their explosions are left behind. But still equally as beautiful.
we were also able to take a look at our own Milky Way, our own galaxy. And we've begun a search to find if there is any other life. A recent study that just came out projects that just in our galaxy alone, there should be billions, billions of habitable worlds. If we're able in the next decade or so to find microbial life on Mars, then we have to assume that it's probably taken root in someplace else. If it hasn't, if we are truly the only life in the universe, then we have a responsibility to keep this precious resource. Why would we why would we ruin our planet as we are doing if we're the only life in the universe? Like we were saying, when we look out with Hubble, we notice that the universe is filled with other galaxies. Each point on here, with the exception of just a few of them, is a galaxy. There's roughly 10,000 in this photo. Each one of these is a galaxy containing hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars. The larger ones sometimes contain close to a trillion. Each one of those stars probably having planets orbiting it. How many of those might have life? So let's consider again this pale blue dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, supreme leader, every saint, sinner in the history of our species, lived there on that tiny mode of dust. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark, and in our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only known world so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we'll ever know. Thank you very much. That's it. I'd be happy to take questions if anybody has any, but, but it's okay. No? Okay, cool. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. What a wonderful convention uh, we've seen so far here at Space Vision. We've seen lots of speakers and uh, on lots of different topics, lots of different subjects. Um, all of them have been uniquely informative and inspiring. I hope you all had a wonderful time here, and we hope you all come back sometime to visit us again soon. So, on behalf of SEDS ASU, thank you for coming to Space Vision 2013.